Welcome to the Lehigh University Art Gallery Teaching Museum. Today is a very special occasion for us. We are everybody that work and volunteer in our operation is very happy. This is a very special uh, exhibition, an exhibition that has a lot of meanings, not only the artwork but also the, the metaphor of poetry. Uh, the metaphor of a lot of different kind of things that we have been uh, doing in our operation here. Therefore, we have a, a lot of interesting things to do. Ours is the commerce of curiosity. Seeds gathered, sifted, tenderly nestled in moss until with sunlight and breath, each will spark like tinder, reveal its secret. Beauty, fragrance, usefulness. Brilliant as sunset, dark as coffee, a bomb. Sent to bloom across oceans, like the children who blossom in our absence. We are men of science, men of faith. This is our praise. One of the things that, that we noticed when Claire and I started, we, we had this idea that we were going to do these books and they were going to be from the point of view of the Bartram women and then we realized there really wasn't anything about the Bartram women. There's like, they kept cows and you know, like, <laughs> here's a wedding gown. I mean, there was like nothing. So uh, we didn't do the whole project based on them, but we figured they were, they were well worth um, a poem because while the Bartram guys were all off expeditioning, they were running the farm and running the business and doing all this, but they're really not acknowledged very much anywhere. Um, and I thought there were 12 trees, and it turned out the 13 was a boxwood, which is like this hedge, which I didn't even know was a tree, but apparently it is. And it seemed like a good metaphor for all these women. So this is the, the poem for the boxwood, and it's called Help Meet. The names repeat. Mary. Anne Elizabeth, shared with a grandmother or a sister lost. Call them the one who died, the one who bore nine children, William's twin, the ones who stayed, who defined the lines of home like hedgerow, functional and unremarked. Their scant artifacts, wedding shawl, broken teacup, one precise drawing of a small woodland bird. Their lives clipped like topiary, rooted, smaller than they could have been had there been the room to roam. Call them dear spouse, dear love, thy good wife. Lay sprigs of boxwood on their graves, <clears throat> remembrance sown evergreen. Um, in the journeys box, um, there's a, a tulip, these big tulip trees, um, and I go hiking in the woods a lot, it's a little embarrassing, because I'm, I'm like, I just play a doctor on TV, like I just play a naturalist. So <laughs> the thing about these tulip trees is the flowers are like so high up, and but when you hike, you see these petals all over the ground, and at some point I look them up, like, what are these things? And it turned out it was the thing I'd written these poems about. <laughs> but anyway. Um, and I don't know, there were, did people know that at one point there was this tulip craze in Europe? People just wanted to buy tulips and crazy tulips. And there, were, there was like a stock market of tulips and all this craziness. Yeah. Tulips. This is for the tulip poplar. Europe. Oh, I forgot one other thing. Collinson, who's in this poem, was his um, sort of agent in England. And they were the ones, they would write letters back and forth, and he would order things, and they would send them back and forth. Europe, coveted tulips. Coolerin, Rosen, Violetin. Named to exalt admirals and generals, even as the plague took sisters and children. They wanted petals of flame, perhaps to remember perhaps to forget, until they oft lost all reason, buying nothing but futures of air and empty promises. 
Collinson writes, send the cones of the tulip tree and whatever else thou thinkst well of. John writes, this is what you need to know. Root it in rich, deep soil, and it will grow to 100 feet. Yield honey to sweeten your bread. Its wood will plain smooth and true to fit the pipes and valves of an organ for you who praise your God with song. It will make a coffin. It will give you shade. This is what I would write. When it catches the breeze, each leaf will capture the light, flutter of its own accord into brightness. In autumn, it will be transformed into a goblet of gold. As for its flowers, they will blossom yellow, orange, red. Too high for us to see, but we imagine them much as we imagine heaven. May I do one more? Um, so John Bartram was cantankerous and um, he, he was, all the Bartrams were Quakers and he was a can, cantankerous Quaker um, <laughs> and he got, he and actually eventually his sons um, got disowned from the Quakers. Uh, so the last section, which is called Storms, the last uh, book, um, this is for a, a tree called the Willow Oak. 1758, without apology. That's when he got drummed out of the Quakers. If within the silent waiting, the air lifts and carries my questions, or the seed within grows until my mind fills with asking, and if my contemplation leads me to seek, to seek how as well as why, until the path of my inquiries appear to you as heresy. I will live within these contradictions, the willow and the oak wedded as one, bending to the wind yet steadfast, rooted as my boot soles pressed into the new world, each inner voice owned by the other, unified in a more certain truth. I realized I forgot an important one. Okay, bear with me. Sure, one or two more. Um, one of the things when you actually go to Bartram's Gardens in Philly, which is, you should come, it's not that far. You can go on the boat, it's great now. Um, you really get this sense of all of these generations that lived, this was a house, this was their home, you know? Um, and you'll notice uh, there's a box uh, that has the, the little medallion portraits that Claire did of the, what we decided were the caretakers and some are the old bar, the oldest Bartrams. Uh, there was actually a freed slave that worked for them, and we actually put, unbeknownst to him, the current curator of Bartram's Gardens is on one of the medallions because he's the current caretaker. Uh, so I'm going to read that, and then I'll read the last one. So this one is called Caretaking. Um, we inherit trees, meadow, a river. Hewn stone home raised up, floorboards worn smooth with lullabies, magnolia more ancient than bees. Dear, please send, forgive, remember me. Generations of singular days awakened and laid to rest, passed hand to hand. This is, is not history. So for the last one, um, the biggest sort of heartbreaker of this big storm was the Yellowwood tree, which was the oldest and biggest tree that just, it was like the storm in like 20 minutes, just took out all these trees. Um, and apparently if you talk to Joel, who's the curator, this happens periodically. Some storm happens, the trees get felled and they grow back. And so the, the storm was in 2010, and by 2012, when we were working on this, there were actually like little snips of this tree. And now if you go again in, in uh, 2016, it's like, it's back. And um, so Solace, which is the title of this poem, and um, the title of the book, I think really felt to me like um, 
kind of what this whole project was. Like how you just have this huge loss, like in half an hour, just all these things are gone. And how do you find solace and how do you make sense of it? Um, so storms, this is in the storm box. This one is dated 2012 and it's called Solace. I had been considering lush green June, how we reach through summer's dwindling days. I had been feeling the shift of night currents, how heat rises over cold, boils into waves. I had been questioning each layered turn, how longevity is mistaken for truth. I had forgotten not only lightning shatters, how a deep breath exhaled on top of us. When we fell grounded, we were held as if by a lover, resting in softness and deep earth dreams, and how, after the long winter, light stretches into day, the timeless rhythm of breath returns. We remember how it is to reach take hold, begin again to grow. Thank you. Thank you. This celebration of poetry is interconnected. You know, it's a thread of everything that we are doing in this semester. Across uh, the hall, a Ryan Rouch, we are having a very beautiful exhibition that is called Visual Poetry, and I encourage you to go and see it. This uh, partnership that we have with Notation is something that will continue all this semester, all the events that they are doing. And another exhibition that we are very, very happy and proud to have is the one in McGuinness, which is the contact prints of one of the greatest American uh, photographer, Robert Frank. This is, we are very, very proud to have that amazing uh, contact print. And we have the, the opening the other day, and we will have that the whole semester. And I really encourage you to go and see it. Continuing that poetry, and now a poetry with a different kind of sound, one of the participants, a great colleague, a, an architect, you know, a musician, uh, a furniture maker who have a piece here, a uh, collaborating piece, Amy Forsyth, she got to do a solo with her fiddle. And this is Amy <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> Ricardo um, asked me to play a fiddle solo um, here. And I have to say that I normally don't, in fact, I have never played in public all by myself. I always have a guitarist right here. And uh, I wish that Dick had brought his guitar because I bet you know this Tom, this tune. I do. <laughs> I would love that. Anyway, but Ricardo said no. Do it yourself. So I'm going to play. Uh, I'm going to play Shebang Shemore for you, which is which is an Irish tune. Do you know that one? Yes, of course. So.
want to talk about the piece in there. I, I did a, the piece that I did was a collaboration. I'd be happy to uh, I want you to. to do that. <laughs> yes. I want you yes. To. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Another thing that I want to mention is you can go also downstairs, and there are some refreshment and some vino. Uh, therefore, you are more than welcome to go downstairs and have some refreshment. Okay. And go and listen to. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very Just much. One second, Ricardo. If any uh, first year students. <laughs>
show you how cool this was when it's on. So, Katie sent this to me. And so, I, I, get, I get this box. I'm like, that's a really cool box. Wooden hinges. And what the heck is that? I don't know. So, I open it up. And inside is the thing that she just threw on the outside. <laughs> And it opens completely different than the last thing. And inside is this other thing with this other drawing on it. So she drew this piece on here. And I had to figure out how to open this one. When I open this one, It's just the cutest thing too because that's the big pencil. It's the big pencil. <laughs> so the whole thing is like the whole thing is about like these little tiny pencils, an array of pencils. So <laughs> and then the drawing of them on it. So but she she did um, she did all these drawings as well. So, and then, uh, so what we did was, in order to collaborate, um, this is this. I made this book uh, to kind of um, show the process of the piece, and it actually fits kind of perfectly right here. So, um, so the proposals that we made in order to um, to, to get the project, and then um, and then these are drawings I made of the things that she sent me. Uh, that was something I was looking at that I wanted to include, and we never, we didn't really do it. But um, I wanted these transformation masks to be part of it, but we didn't really do that. <laughs> and then this was from Katie's sketchbook. So the whole thing is like this process. My my initial sketches, and it kind of goes on for a while. We went back and forth. This is uh, one of Katie's drawings where she's kind of mapping the brain. Uh, the whole thing is like this whole kind of process of, of the making of this piece. So, and then I bound it into this book. What's your favorite part about this entire piece? Uh, I really liked the fact that there was a collaboration. You know, so I, I learned some things that I wouldn't have done. Like I think I would have made wooden hinges myself. And then, um, and I, I've actually used them ever since. I've got, I've, I've, I really like them. They are really sculptural. Really? So I, I use them a lot now. In fact, I get my furniture students to make them too, because you can do all kinds of great sculptural stuff with it. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, it's really funny to revisit it after I haven't seen it in a couple of years. <laughs> and um, it's so big. I'm, I don't know what I'm going to do with this thing. <laughs> I want a museum to buy it, so I don't have to like have it in the house. This is like a refrigerator. What the heck am I going to do with this thing? What was I thinking? <laughs> so, unfortunately, I've, I've, I've gotten in the habit of making really big things. I made this giant chair next, so I'm, I'm shrinking now. I've got to make small things because it's, it's ridiculous. <laughs> so, and I was thinking your questions. I'm How did you come up with the idea with the, the pencil case? It looks like one of those Russian Oh, pencils. see, I didn't make that. Okay. So that was that's, that's what Katie sent me. Okay. Oh. And so, so it was this whole thing about, so what that is, is basically, it's a band, it's called a bandsaw box. Right. And so you start with a lump of wood and you start cutting parts off and removing yeah. the pieces and then gluing it back together. Right. And so she's saving all the parts as she goes. And uh, I, I think it's brilliant. It's really amazing. But I didn't do that. She did. <laughs> um, but, I, but then I, I, I took things from it, like the, the hinges, and yeah. then said, okay, what can I do with this thing to turn it into a real sculptural statement? And if you come around here, you'll see that uh, I was trying to do something almost architectural with it. So um, we become almost industrial kind of building trusses that are holding this thing together. 
ironically, they're not that strong. <laughs> because I think what, what I've done since is I, I, um, I put pieces in between that kind of reinforce it. Because the whole thing is we've got these sort of fingers that work, and that's pretty cool, and I like what happens with the facets. Right. But this is really risky. You know, if somebody leans on that man, snap. <laughs> so, um, so that's something I'm, I'm now developing a little bit more as I work on uh, the wooden hinges, because you can do it all different ways. So all, it's all about just these things kind of pivoting. Right. So it's it's a really simple idea, but you can make sculptures out of them, which I really like. Can't you just piece like put like a piece of like a piece of wooden? Well, that's that's actually what I've done, and I, I did it here in order to to attach it. But and and I certainly could do that um, at some point, but it's been out on tour. <laughs> so. Absolutely beautiful. Thank you.